and now I think the screen is up and going so we are good to go all right so I talked about uh, locking and locking and all the good stuff that we had with mutexes we said that when we fire up our uh, uh, actions in the threads and we want to um, use specific types of resources and make sure that we are not going to have data racing we need to sometimes block threads to do something and then unlock it as, as we continue and uh, we do that with we said we're going to do that with we can do that with mutexes mutexes are lock mechanisms that you can set up and you share it with your um, threads and uh, your threads are going to just uh, 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 check the locks and don't do anything until um, the resources are unlocked and as soon as they are locked they lock it and they continue the thing so each one that locks prevents other threads to to continue their work and uh, that's how mutexes work so the next thing we wanted to talk about over here is that if we look at the locks right now at the moment and as you see uh, the problem with these locks is that they are going to be treated as kind of pointers if you lock and unlock you'll be in trouble so what can we do to um, actually um, what can we do to not forget how to lock the keys and then unlock them if you recall for pointers when we were working with pointers not to forget to allocate and deallocate the pointers what did we use anybody remember yes two of you three four smart pointers is what we used we use smart pointers and only three people responded so they're all the rest of us are already in deep sleep or I did a very bad job teaching smart pointers last time so smart pointers are we gonna what we're gonna use to to I <laughs> Marcus that was nice all right yeah so that Z Z Z that you see over there that Marcus's response so yeah so smart pointers is what we use we we to manage uh, 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 to manage uh, uh, pointers and make sure that uh, um, uh, we use the RAII request acquisition is initialization with the pointers which means that the lifetime of each pointer is tied to its smart pointer and when the smart pointer comes to life and goes out of life automatically it deallocates all its resources and therefore we're not going to have any problem we need to have the same mechanism for the locks and to do that what we uh, have is uh, uh, what we call a lock guard so what a lock guard is it is essentially uh, <clears throat> an object that does nothing but uh, this one was mutexes so let me just put over here a mutexes mutex.cpp to lock or unlock a mutex what we can create is a lock guard lock guard is exactly like a like a smart pointer that you pass a pointer to it but lock guard receives a mutex and the mutex that it receives is what we pass to it so instead of locking and unlocking the mutex you create a lock guard whatever else you call it and you pass the mutex to it this lock guard automatically instantiates and upon because of RIR AII um, uh, it as soon as it gets created it locks the key and because it's created in this scope when the scope is over it unlocks the key, uh, it gets destroyed and upon its destruction the key is unlocked and therefore mute as it unlocks it allows for the next uh, for the next uh what should we call it um for the next um um uh, threat to uh, continue its work so uh it works exactly uh the same way as locking and unlocking and it's much uh more safe than using actually uh 
mutexes by itself so mm, if in case you have mm, uh, um, complex tasks and you forgot to unlock a mutex then the whole program hangs because the thread stops over there and everybody's waiting for the uh, thread to unlock so the result is exactly the same absolutely no difference uh, and yeah, it just uh, 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 works the exact way and as you see one gets locked and the other one gets unlocked and everything is perfectly clear so instead of locking a mutex and unlocking it you create an instance of lock guard of top mutex and you say um, you name it something whatever you want um, the, uh, and you um, uh, assign it to the key and that's that lock guards cannot be copied and the key cannot be uh, uh, be passed around so um, after uh, lock guard was introduced uh, let me just put this one over here after lock guard was introduced iman yes go ahead so is lock guard just a pointer to the mutex no it's an object whose resource is a mutex and it's in cons it, it in its constructor it locks the key in its destructor it unlocks the key so the so the it locks and unlocks the actual mutex right yeah so it has a reference inside Oh, and okay. the reference is initialized to the mutex that you are receiving it's a reference to this type that reference is initialized to what you are passing to it and it calls the on the the lock method of what is passed to it in okay, its sorry. destructor it, yeah okay thanks no problem wilson go ahead In, does that mean in line 11 and line 23, I don't have to use key.lock or key.unlock because it's going to do it either way, right? No, no, no. That, if I created a lock guard over here, yes. But in here, I need that key lock and unlock because I want to pause these uh, threads before okay. I start anything. So that go thingy that you see is the unlock. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So that, yeah, so that lock, we cannot, if, if I put a lock, the problem to put, I could do it like this over here. So essentially I could do it like this. I could create something like this. And now in here, I could say uh, lock guard. Mutex let's say i don't know local or m m for main mutex and i'm going to pass the key to it like that and i didn't need this anymore you follow what i did i just opened the dummy scope over here and created a lock guard in it and then when the lock guard is over it's going to actually uh, kill it and, uh, but the problem is that now my threads <laughs> so check it on the egg now my threads are local so uh, no actually it didn't work because my my threads are over here and i can't do that unless i made it as a as a pointer or something so forget about what i wrote anyways but you follow what i'm saying right lock guard is 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 tied to its scope if i created a lock guard like this over here the problem would be that it would uh it would essentially unlock here at return. So yeah, that's gonna be a little bit of a uh, problem. So because of that, um, yeah, I'm not gonna put the lock guard. I was hoping to do something uh, cute and uh, interesting, but because uh, the threads went into the scope over there, I got in trouble. Anyways, so that's that. So, after the introduction of lock guard in C++17, uh, a, a kind of a um, more efficient or um, um, better type of lock was introduced, is, uh, and the name was scoped lock. So scoped lock for you, it's exactly like lock guard. It's as if somebody renamed it, but that's not really uh, uh, the case. So. At, when, when you see over here, what do you see over here? You, you, you can exactly see what's going on here, right? So I have, um, what you may call it, uh, um, uh, the exact same thing, but instead of lock card, I have scope lock. Now, what is scope lock? 
Lock guard and slope guard are both in C++ uh, standard library construct. That is, uh, they are used for managers, uh, and it cr they create a um, 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 what should we call it? Uh, um, uh, a safe and exception proof execution for for the lock guards. It, for the for the mutex it's, it's impossible for a mute for a for a mutex not to get unlocked at the end of its scope they are both implementing the resource acquisition is initialization principle which essentially as soon as they get created they they lock and when they uh, so essentially the 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 the, 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 the resource is tied to its lifetime um, so um, uh, yeah, so so mm, let me let me see how to put it in. Um, so yeah, so they are they are both essentially tied up to to uh, uh, the the mutexes are tied to their lifetime. And as soon as they get destroyed, uh, they they uh, 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 unlock it, and this prevents the the concurrency issues like deadlocks and forgotten unlocks and things like that. Um, a, a lock card automatically locks a mutex and uh, it unlocks when it goes out of scope uh, it's not copyable of move or movable you cannot copy or move a lock card and it's very straightforward and um, it works as you see there's nothing hidden behind it uh, a scoped lock was introduced in C++ 17 it is um, a, a more uh, improved uh, uh, way of implementing a lock card and the, f the difference is that it can accept several mutexes unlike lock guard scope lock you can have key one key two key three comma separated pass it to it and it it accepts them all so you can pass more than one mutex to it let's put it that way and it locks them all up and unlocks them all at the end of the uh, if it's like lifetime uh, it should you should prefer scope uh, lock to lock guard in in uh, C++ codes that you're reading writing if your uh, C++ compiler is C++ 17 and later and it is much more flexible and it's safe and uh, um, when you have complex mutex locking scenarios where you have to lock three mutexes and uh, unlock them it comes much ha much more handy instead of having three lock guards you just add one scope lock and it's done but they both m manage mutexes automatically so it, in that manner there is no difference between them and they are both RAII and um, not copyable and movable and um, yeah so that's it we have other type of locking mechanism for mutexes um, one is called unique lock um, uh, it is more flexible than lock guard and scope lock it can lock and unlock mutexes multiple times so it has methods that you can lock and unlock uh, uh, mutexes with it but of course when it goes off scope it's gonna uh, uh, um, unlock the mutex but if you it, you, throughout your process you want to lock and unlock uh, your mutex you can use unique lock for that uh, and shared lock is a unique lock is exactly like a unique pointer and we have a shared lock that uh, shares a mutex between different threads these are not things that are covered in our thing I'm just letting you know that they exist so um, research them uh, read about them and and see what they are so we have so the types of locks that we have are essentially these let me just put them for you uh, we have lock guard we have scoped scoped lock scoped lock we have unique lock That is exactly like a unique pointer, which means only one mutex um, uh, will be set to it. And we have shared lock that can uh, pass around. Uh, the several locks can work on the same mutex. And they all are RAII, which means when they are all going off scope um, and uh, they are all gone, then uh, their resources are going to get uh, unlocked. Wilson, go ahead. Okay, so 
just to make sure scope lock basically we can pass multiple mutexes in as an argument so basically yes. it can have multiple resources um of mutexes correct or yeah so so essentially this is what you do so um so it's so with with so if you have let's say you have uh, s where do i do it uh So yes, say you have uh, uh, mutex uh, M1 and and M2, uh, and then when you want to pr protect the scope, now in here you can actually say scoped lock, and well, um, what do we put over here? Scope locked. Um, uh, let's put it uh, lock. And then you have M1 and M2, something like that. And this is going to secure this. Okay? Okay. So, um, so you can pass many to it. Also, one more thing. I was kind of busy taking notes on, like, um, the mutex um, about, like, how, thing, um, how, like, it's, uh, how lock guard would be, like, once this constructor locks the box of mutex, and then after the structure unlocks, um, yeah, unlocks the mutex. Um, so did you say, I, I'm pretty sure you said one other thing about scope lock. Um, could you go over that again? So, like there was, so the similarities between the scope lock and lock guard is that they both manage mutexes automatically. Okay. Uh, they both lock and unlock. Upon the, they both unlock uh, upon destruction. They both um, um, apply RAII, and they are not copyable and movable. The difference between ah. the two is that a scope lock can handle multiple mutexes, where lock guard is only for single. Uh, ah. Scope lock avoids avoids deadlocks in scenarios involving multiple mutex mutexes. And it handles multiple mutexes. Yeah, when it handles multiple mutexes, it, it, it prevents deadlocks. Deadlock is when one yeah. lock waits for another lock to unlock, and the other one waits for this one to unlock. So they are indefinitely waiting for each other. That's called a deadlock. Okay, so it prevents yeah. that. And it is much more versatile, and it should be used in C++ modern code that you have. So essentially, wherever you want to use uh, uh, lock guard, use a scope lock instead. Let's put it this way: every place that you can lock, you had lock guard, you can rename it to scope lock. Let's put it this way. But the other way is not possible. <laughs> okay. All right. So this is the scope lock. Uh, professor? Yes. Uh, I do want to ask about, um, just because I know you've mentioned that you can have multiple keys or make, play in multiple mutexes, basically multiple doors, yes. but how would that affect um, the the threads? Wouldn't, uh, isn't each mutex basically stopping all threads? Oh, no, no, no. Each mutex stops the, the, the threads having those mutex. Oh, okay, it's okay. a very so... complex situation. Threads are not something that I can give it to you lightly. And I told you, I told you this, and you know exactly what's going on. Depending on okay. what you are doing, just imagine that you want. It's, it's. You have to always think of threads at, as people with their own, with the mind, with the mind of their own. Each one is okay. doing their own business. At certain moment of time, they have to wait for another person to do its job before they can continue. In okay, those okay. cases, you're going to create mutexes in both threads and make the one that is supposed to make the other one wait, lock the mutex so the other one can wait for it and then continue the work and unlock so the other one can continue the work. I see. So basically, the mutex basically connects two threads to make them work in, uh, so they can say, okay, you go first and you go first, you they, go first. It's they, like they the channel that they, like communicates say, between. Yeah, they, so they can collaborate, <laughs> if I can, if okay, I can so, use that work for it. 
they, they you know okay, I cannot okay. say synchronized but they they, they, they because the resources okay. could be common, one of them may need to wait for a resource to be provided. And that's where lots right. comes to play. And then if like, for instance, if you have multiple mutexes, you have one mute, they, let's say you have three different threads. The thread number two is connected to, is reliant on both thread one and red thread three. So you create two different mutexes and red, thread two has both mutexes exactly. one is connected to thread three one is connected to thread one exactly. and it allows you to work with both of them. okay exactly exactly okay 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 i All get right. that okay uh wilson by any chance could you actually show us an example of scope guard uh being used Sc scoped scoped lock you mean i'm um, yeah scope scope lock scope lock it's right in front of you that's a scope. No, but like with multiple meat. Oh my God, that's like a very difficult place to go. No, that's way beyond our, beyond the, maybe a, when I finish everything, if we are covered everything throughout the semester and I have nothing else to go through, ask me and I'm going to write you an example for it. It's going to take too much time now, but I will give it to you if you want, because these are all extra. These are not supposed to be taught because I'm doing it. I don't want to waste the time that of other stuff with this. When the other, when everything, well, all the topics are covered, ask me, I'll do it for you. Okay. And I hope that that's going to happen. Anyways. So the next thing I wanted to say was, yeah. So, um, uh, you, the way we are actually dealing with the, um, with mutexes now is that we are having separate uh, threads created and then one by one we are joining them. This is not really the way multi-threading works. Uh, when you have multiple threads that you want to deal with it, what you need to do is to put everything in a vector and then make the vector for you handle the, the thread. So, if, for example, what I want to do is to do the exact same task that I've done before to go through these uh, things that I want to print, instead of having uh, three threads created separately, what should I do? I should create a vector of threads and then one by one push the threads right into the vector. And remember, each one that is being pushed, and that's the time that actually they get fired up and they get uh, they start working and then using uh, and, uh, as a simple loop I can go through the threads and one by one join them and see exactly what happens so so what you see right now over here is the exact same thing as uh, the program that we have written that is actually running through the three different threads and uh, the only difference is that is actually done with a thread vector. So thread vectors are the most common way of writing multitask uh, um, applications where you put each functionality in an, uh, and push it into a vector so you can manage it later on. Um, so Thread vectors, let's call it thread vectors. That's it. Now, um, the exact same thing. So, uh, the exact same thing happens exactly like uh, if I want to use, like this is, this is the one that I'm using with functions. The exact same thing with functors works the same way. It does not make any difference. As you see, it is identical. This is the same thing that I had with. Um, uh, the uh, uh, with an operator uh, overloaded for my characters thingy that I have and um, they work exactly the same way so I essentially pass the uh, uh, the reference of what I have into the uh, uh, functor that I have and I execute the functors one by one and uh, um, that's how it works so um, as you see uh, the functors are here and they're all passed by reference over here so it actually um, 
when the set sets the values, everything's going to get uh, set back in them, and uh, it works the exact same way. And one by one, they are pushed into the the thread, and uh, they are joined back afterwards, and it works uh, the exact same way for the three. Okay, that's uh, 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 using thread vectors with functors. So. Go ahead, Iman. Okay, so just to make sure, when you when you join a thread to the main thread, it, it stops its execution, right? It doesn't stop the execution. It's the exact opposite. When it stop when it stops its execution, it becomes joinable. If the execution uh, doesn't stop, it pauses at join until the execution is complete. So like. It's so the, see, we say a thread has a state. It can be joinable. It is joinable. Or it, when you say the state, uh, it is joinable. Uh, 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 a thread reaches to its joinable state. It means it completed its execution. Now it can come back and join the main process. Okay, so in here, like in the first thread that you created in line twenty-five, mm -hmm. does it? Is it? Does does the execution start at line 25? Yes. Yeah? Yes. But again, Sorry? remember, yes, it does. Oh, okay. But, 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 remember this. This is extremely important to understand. When you call its execution, it's not instantaneous. The execution command goes through, but it's a separate thread that is running. Yeah, so yeah. the second one, it starts running too. So this gets fired up, then this gets fired up, then this gets... This doesn't wait for the other one to get fired up. Do you understand this? Yeah. So like if you didn't have the condition in the for loop that like if you had a, if you had a statement that would run forever, will it stop when you're joining it to the main thread? Explain that again. Explain your question one more time. Like, if you if you didn't have any condition in the for loop, like if it was just it's a just while loop, to, if it was just a while loop to print something to the output, will the it execution? Yeah, I can't do anything until they are joined. If you don't have the join, it's gonna hang over there. They are waiting to get joined. No, no, I'm asking like, if, will it? Will it? You stop said if you don't have a if you don't have a condition or a for loop, my for yeah. loop doesn't have a condition. It's uh, for each loop. What are you talking about? No, I'm talking about the uh, function that is passed to the thread. Okay, the function that is passed to the thread. Mm -hmm. Like the oh yeah. here you mean so yeah, so yeah, in yeah. here. So yeah, it, it won't, then it would hang. This it would stop right over here because it's waiting for it to join. Okay, it would stop at the join. Okay, oh, got yeah. it. thank you. Oh yeah, that's that that's exactly essentially you have you have a a, a thread lock. It's been locked and it's not coming out. It's as if it's locked, but never unlocked. Something like that happens. So it's, it literally stops. If I don't have a condition, uh, stop condition over there, you're absolutely right. Join will never happen. The thread never becomes joinable. All right. Now, next one is how do we use mutexes when we are actually dealing with uh, 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 thread vectors? The process is exactly the same, absolutely no difference. So what you have over here, I have a scope lock over here that is locking uh, my mutex because I want to this to run the first and the next and the next. So this scope lock is now locking. And what I will do over here is simply this. I pass the mutex by reference to my thread and therefore the uh, function of mine that is receiving uh, the number of integers that is supposed to increase to see how many things are printed will receive the mutexes reference over here and scope lock it. After it's being scope locked, the rest of them will be locked. Therefore, until it won't, one thread will not execute until the other one 
uh, is finished. Now, every time we run, it nobody knows if it's going to be this one first, this one, or this one. One of these are going to run, but as soon as one of them runs, it stops the other. And now, threads are running in sequence. So they are actually being locked as we are going through. So as you see, first this and that one. And as you see, the first one is dash, second one is uh, caret, and third one is underline. But this is not the same sequence we have in here. You, it's not predictable and you cannot say which thread will um, lock the mutex first. So that's that one. Um, uh, is there a way to ensure that a thread start going in a certain order to basically uh, you want to uh, you'll have an additional uh, you'll have an additional mutex <laughs> okay additional mutex so, so to have an additional ensure mutex you add it to the, the first one and then when you're doing the so the first one will have a specific type of mutex and you you uh, uh, lock that one okay got it got it all right, so that's that one. But that never happened. Yeah, yeah, you're right. No, that's fine. This is fine. Okay, so now let's get out of this. So what I want to talk about is making promises. So... Uh, let me bring these first in. So I, um, this is a question that I have. Um, um, is it a valid thing? Like, and I want you to really think about this. Um, it, it's talk, I'm talking about English language. In English language, when you make a promise to someone on anything, those promises are always kept in future. Is that a valid thing to say, that you always keep your promises in future? You, it, it needs a little bit of time to, uh, to uh, digest it. Now, Gordon says no. Why no? <laughs> and Sazini says no. Why? And many people are saying no. Omar says no. Omar, what's going on? How can it's you? Bec it's because the thing is, it's because of how English and also how sometimes like language works. Because it's different with English because you can be talking about a promise that you're doing something right now. I'm promising you, no, I'm said, doing this said, right. If I make like, a promise to you, any time. Yeah, if you make promise, a promise. Can you, is it possible that you did that before? Yes, you can How? because you, it's like I, I, I'm, I'm making a promise that I have already did this before. You're, you're, you're as if like you're making a vow that you've already done yeah, it and you're going to keep it. The result of the promise is always in the future. Yeah, yes, in like lot, and if you're talking about logical speech, but the thing is how people speak. That's the problem with how oh, people yeah, yeah, no, no, no. human speak. About, I'm not talking yeah. about. I'm talking about. Um, Dude, yeah, yeah. The, the concept of a promise. A concept of a yeah. The concept of a promise is 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 is, be, is, 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 is to be kept in future. That's we always yes. Uh, yeah. And uh, yes, I that's agree. Omar. Now, uh, Sazini, go ahead. Why you said no? And Gordon. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, I don't think I understood the question properly. Like you said, like if we have a promise and then when you make like, a promise, it doesn't get fulfilled. You're gonna say, I when promise, I'm... I promise I'm gonna buy you ice cream. Then the ice cream will be bought in future, right? But you can like uh renege on that promise, right? You can not in the end buy me ice no, cream. No, 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 like... no, We are we are we are talking about good people. <laughs> <laughs> who, who make, who, if you are a person who always keeps, I don't believe you <laughs> if you are a person who always keep your promise promise yeah. is always kept in future Gordon are we okay. uh, in, in agreement on that okay I totally misunderstood because I thought it would be like oh that person could not keep their promise in the future no no why everybody's thinking bad about this I'm thinking I'm talking about good people making promises <laughs> Okay, and promise that we are making, we don't want to duplicate our promise. So the promise that we are making, we're going to make it uh, and make sure that we have the same promise everywhere. So so if I'm telling that uh, 
if in in when I'm uh, I want to make a promise right now. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to say I want to create a function that finds some of the numbers of series of numbers. And before doing that, because I want to find uh, the sum of series of numbers, I'm going to create a type def to an unsigned long long integer unsigned long long ull so ull will be unsigned long long so i'm going to say i'm going to create a function sum and in this function sum i'm going to make a promise that i'm going to provide an unsigned long long called i don't know uh, some promise okay and the sum will start with it uh, so the sum of these numbers so I'm gonna say um, uh, it's the sum of all the numbers between the beginning and the end and the programming for it would be very simple so I'm gonna create uh, an unsigned long long that's that's the sum and I'm gonna set that one to zero then I'm gonna say for uh, let's let's have uh, uh, and I over here too and and I'm gonna say over here uh, for I set to beginning and I less than or equal to end I'm gonna say and uh, uh, I'm gonna make sum plus equal I and I'm gonna add one to I okay so uh, oh So this is going to find the sum of all the numbers that we have, okay? And then after it's done, I'm going to say my promise is the promise I'm making is this. Got it, everyone? Does it English was make sense? I am making a promise for an online on unsigned long long I'm gonna call it some promise and I'm gonna say that uh, I'm gonna find the sum between this and this and the value of my promise will be the sum okay so that's what I'm doing in here okay now let's say I have a ginormous number so I'm gonna have uh, unsigned long long uh, beginning will be zero and end will be one two three one two three one two three one let's say a huge number so that's what you have so now let me create the sum promise so in here I'm gonna say my promise for an unsigned long long will be what is it going to be it will be um, some promise okay now I need to make this promise in future so I have to create a future for myself to be able to do that so I'm gonna say future for an uns future promise for an uh, future that comes for an on unsigned long long I'm gonna call it some future and I'm gonna set it to my some promises uh, get future so <clears throat> what happens this some promise of mine when it's done it's not not done now but this some promise is gonna be happening in future when it happens its future will be returned to me now what I will do over here is this I'm going to say, I'm going to create a thread, say t1, and I'm going to say call the sum function, move my sum promise, sum promise, why is it not? some promise yes move my some promise uh, from the beginning to the end am 
I good? All right. Then in here I'm going to say mass is being done. Then I'm going to say the sum is and in here I'm going to say give me did I call it some <laughs> future let me put it properly future yeah so I'm going to say over here give me the value of that thing that you promised to me this is the future give it back to me and I'm gonna go and uh, and then uh, in here I'm gonna say see out done and now I'm gonna say t1 dot join join me back okay so let's analyze this code I am writing a function and I'm gonna say in f I'm going to make you a promise to give you an unsigned long long that is sum of something from beginning to the end so if you give me from this number to that number I'm going to find the sum of everything for you and then return it back to you in here I'm saying this is the beginning this is the end some big number then I'm going to say that I'm going to make a promise I, I need to I need to get a promise that it's some promise the future of this promise is the future some promise that I'm creating so I'm getting the future of the promise that is supposed to be made in then I'm gonna say hey thread find the sum get the sum promise and go from beginning to the end and then when the math is done I'm gonna say hey it is the future give me the promise that you gave me the, the value of the promise that you that you that you wouldn't ask and then uh, it, it passes the value to me so if I run this program it will go through that thing and it tries to find the sum and it gives me what the sum is obviously it takes it it takes a while and it passes through it but now that I have done this I can do it even better now that I have now that I can create a promise and as you see the promise happens in future what I can do is to create another promise let's call it some promise two two and two so what I'm doing in here now is just creating a second promise and in in this thread instead of just having one thread I'm gonna have two threads the first one is getting the promise and the second one is the getting the promise too and then I'm saying over here go up to n divided by 2 and in here go from n divided by 2 plus 1 up to n and now in here I'm gonna say the answer is some future 2 dot get now what happened now I create and obviously I'm gonna say t2.join and now what I did was to actually create the values in two separate threads and each one of them taking the promise that they were supposed to set a future for it for me and then pass it to me so what I do over here I split the task of the two promises by half and when I run the program three years later it runs it but in half a time if I want to make it more I can create yet another promise and then make it three go up to one third one to third to half the third and so on and so forth and and uh, that's that so by creating promises you can create values that are supposed to be set in future when the thread does its job and these some these futures will not 
have any values until the thread has done its job. Do we understand this? And this, Omar, go ahead. Okay, uh, I just want to be certain uh, before I, I go off. Uh, so does, for like, for instance, for line 26, does it wait, it's, it's waiting for both promises to, uh, both futures to, for them to actually happen. Exactly. And it doesn't just, okay. So if you were to, for instance, put them in different order because they're in two different threads, uh, the, the time it would take, you wouldn't know which feature would come first because the fact is both threads are running at their own time yes. and you don't, you don't know the speed of the threads. So yes. if you would want to, so this is one way to make sure that all features keep going at the same time, but okay. So, so, so it's, it's easy. the thing is that the promises that are made are passed to threads, right? Yeah. Now, if what we have is a simple calculation that has equal time, I understand yeah. what you're saying which means uh, like equal time, then it's going to be exactly half a time. Yeah, a little yeah more. pretty much. But yeah. if you were searching through massive amount of data, yeah. okay, and you have one series of 5 million things that you want to find one thing out of it, if you write yeah. one thread, it, the, we always look at worst case scenario. Worst case yeah. scenario is for you to go from one to 5 million, correct? Yes. If I break the search in two, now worst case scenario for it will be from one to 25 million, to two and a half million, correct? All right. Am I getting there? Yeah, yeah I, get, I, I, get, I, get, I get what but, you mean. I get what, what you mean. I'm saying so, is that, but what I'm mm -hmm. saying is that in this thread, the difference between multi-threading and is that it averages the speed up. If okay. the first element that the first one finds out is the one, yeah then it has to wait for two and a half million unsuccessful search to pass through to give you the answer. So the yes. best case scenario for this will be half a time of search, where the best okay. case scenario for five million is zero. Okay. Uh, is there a way to get, like, for instance, for, ex for example, with the search is to you like for instance you have split into four different uh, four uh, this like uh like a uh, hundred thousand uh, uh uh entries and you split them into four yes. is and you have each you have four different uh futures waiting for the search values to come in is there a way to determine uh the first one that comes out the one that gets the actual answer oh, yes, instead of, of just course. waiting for the other three okay of course you pass a reference of a, a, a regular atomic variable to it and you set it to false and every one of them will check it as soon as one of them said it to true everybody that stops okay 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 i see i see so that's what you would do okay yes, that's why so, i wanted so, i wanted so, to make sure yes yeah, so if if this was a search what i would do i would have an atomic boolean called found passed to all ah. these things and then what i would do i would check to see if it's not true i will continue my search as soon as it becomes uh true then i would stop true. the search then everybody okay would start perfect Okay, okay, okay. I get it. I get it. And then you would have like an atomic variable that would hold the entry that was found. Yeah, one of the problems with threads is that when students or anybody who starts working with threads, they deal with them, they forget that these are just functions, although they are separate yeah. programs running. But these are those functions that can have access to the main calling thread. And they can okay. yeah, set up values and so on and so forth. Are we okay? Okay, perfect. Yeah, okay. I get that now. Uh, who? Iman. So is there a particular reason that you're passing an R value to the sum function? Yeah, because I do, I want it to move. I want the same promise to be there. I don't want the promise to change. I want can to move you, the can promise. Can you just pass a reference? I don't want it to be copied. I don't want it to be copied. Uh, okay, so, and then if you put the joins before the print, before printing the sum is... No, 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 that's not going to happen. Oh. If you, it, it has to be done before join. Because I thought that the join will wait for the thread to end and then pass on. Yeah, but you're not realizing that the main is a thread of its own. Joins are not happening simultaneously. 
joins are happening simultaneously with the with the main. Oh, so it passes on. It doesn't. When you stop say join over here, not necessarily join is at this line. <laughs> you follow what I'm oh, saying? Okay. Okay, main okay. is a third process that is happening beside T1 and T2. Never forget that. Okay. Got it? Got it, got it. Okay, okay. All right, so that's the first promise thingy that we have. But life is beautiful when it comes to promises. I'll tell you why. Because all these complex stuff are done in a much easier way. EFG dot G dash uh, promise made in threats. But if you recall, I mentioned that a thread can never receive a thread, can never execute a function that returns something. It has to be void. Now, what we have is this. Instead of creating a function that doesn't return anything, I can actually create a function that returns something. So this function of mine is doing the same thing, but the difference is actually returning the, uh, the value that it wants. So this one is actually return the value as it, as it, as, uh, that it wants. So now if I want to simultaneously run this instead of a thread, I can use what we call an async. What is the difference between async than a thread? An async actually returns a value. What is the value that it returns? It's the promise value of the function that is returned and its type. So this function returns an integer. So it returns a promise, a, f uh, a future, sorry, for the promise that this value that is returned is in it. So you don't need to worry about creating a promise. All you need to do to have a future of type of the return function, the return value of the function, and run it in async. Async will create the promise for you, will set it, and do everything asynchronously for you. So this essentially works like the other one, but the difference is that you don't have to create the promise. Async will return you the future, therefore we'll have a get, and you're done after that. So all you need to do is to run it like this, and then everything happens within it so you don't have to worry about any uh, joining statements and things like that there is no thread over here to join everything is joined automatically at the end of it yes Wilson um can we could we just like call the function and then afterwards pass the promise as the argument without using a thread and then afterwards kind of oh, yeah, just slowly, do the same slowly. thing so you, you, here. Think, you think too fast for my brain go a little sm slower please one more time Okay, so let's say we want to pass a promise to a function that returns value, correct? Okay. Oh, no, no, not returns value. Promises are, are sent in a way that they are passed by argument, not returning anything to them. So promises are passed, yes. promises are passed through the argument list because you need to move them in. Yeah. See? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So you were saying, so we passed it. Oh, this is not the one. Where is my, where is my, did I, did I forget to? No, this is the one, yeah. So there you go. So you pass it through the argument list. You right, and then afterwards, yeah, and then afterwards, once we do that, oh, wait, never mind, never mind, never mind. <laughs> never mind. I understand now, never mind, never mind. Okay, all right, okay. So, yeah, because, like, I, a, see, I yeah. see what you're doing. But with async, everything is automized. You don't need to worry about any joining. You don't, you don't need to worry about anything. You simply pass the function that you want to run in parallel into async, and you get multiple futures, and you do a get, and you're done. So all the joining and everything, all they are all done in the async. As soon as async's lifetime gets over, it automatically joins everything back in. Okay? So this is a very nice way, actually, to, uh, uh, to work with this. So, yes, that's uh, async, yes.
Jonathan. Uh, we have to just to, yeah, just to make sure. Go ahead, go ahead. Who's talking? Is it Jonathan? Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Um, just to make sure the async avoids the use of join at the end, right? Because they like yeah, they because stack it, up. Yeah, because it comes like a package. Like you go, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, perfect. Thank you. All right. So that's that. Uh, now, uh, yes. I do have one question. Is uh, both for, uh, because I should have asked this last week, but I wanted to ask for both of th this now. For promises, threads, futures, what like what are the like the typical exceptions or like are there like i know the 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 um like the uh the 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 lock the locks the share locks that we create that they don't throw uh, uh exceptions but ace the async what exceptions would you try to be catching if you were dealing with an async function or with a thread or with a uh or would you try to be catching the exception with the future instead of the async function itself. Like, I, I want to know how would you do exception handling in particular with, uh, I'll just say, just let's try to just do it with async and then I'll probably ask it for a thread. So how would you deal with exception handling with uh, async? Um, in the thread library, um, the, the several exceptions can be thrown, okay? Um, these are typically um, issues with threat management and execution. Uh, so um, there is, um, um, uh, what should we call it? Uh, threat resource error, there is a system error, there is uh, um, invalid argument uh, exception, there is, um, there are so many other <laughs> threat ID it, uh, can result in uh, uh, exception, but uh, the, I don't know what you mean. Like you, the name of the exceptions is that what you're asking? Yeah, because like, uh, well, I'm just like, I'm just wondering, just like, uh, how would I mean when you're when you're dealing with the thread? Uh, at what, well, how big of the scope do you do you have to in, like? For instance, if you're creating a thread, you say T1, you create this thread. Would the when you're doing the try catch, would the join be outside uh, outside of the try catch block, or would it still be within the uh, no, everything inside the try? The, everything's inside. Okay, everything's yeah, everything is going to be inside the try. Inside okay, the try, yeah. And um, if okay. I, I thread exceptions that I got, I got. What did I got? The thread exceptions that I got. Um, I'm just trying to remember. Mm. The thread has a resource error. It has system error. It has invalid argument error. It has ID. It has uh, terminate. Um, yeah. I think these are the ones. But generally, okay. generally, generally, I just do general exceptions. So <laughs> then I okay, I can see what is it and I just print the message and see which one was it and then I'm gonna Which it was, okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So it's and it's for the class, so I really ah, can't you see there are so many exceptions. Yeah, I'm so, I'm so... Oh, yeah, sorry about that. And for the same thing for the for the async uh, functions, you would do both the future as well as the async function itself would all be inside the try and then you would do the catching. But, but remember, the exceptions that are thrown, mm. uh, if, if an exception is thrown inside the threat, threat function, okay, and is not yeah. caught, it will result in a termination of the program. Okay, so then if... Uh, will, will come out. It is... Okay, it is, okay. Yeah, so it is important to catch the exception, okay? Okay, so uh, like for instance, so like uh, so if, for instance, you have that thread. Let's say you say T one, and there was an exception thrown with inside T one because some other function threw the exception. If would uh, would you reach the join first, or would the or would the exception uh, uh, would the exception just stop the thread no, and no, then you, you would have, have to try to catch have, it with the main? You have a join, and it's it's a non joinable tre thread and you call join yes. through it, then you get a system yeah. error exception thrown. Okay, okay, I'm making sure, okay. All right, but again, believe me, there are so many, get a general exception at the end, print it out, see which one it is, then you can go by detail. That's what you what I usually do when I don't know what okay, it is. Okay. You can always Google it and find out what it is, but it's better to look at the documentation. All right. All right, so now that we are at this stage, uh, 
Um, so this is uh, now 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 using asyncs with. Uh, let me just g h a async instead of thread returning returning values accepted. Okay, so what you can do, like if if you have uh, uh, if you want to use vectors to use async instead of creating vector of threads, you simply create a vector of futures, and you push back asyncs into it, and it becomes the exact same thing. So uh, you see, this is the exact same thing. All I'm doing uh, instead of creating three separate futures and add them up. I'm creating a vector of futures of type integer because I know it is returning integer. One by one, I'm returning the asyncs into my uh, uh, vectors. It fires them up. And then afterwards, I can either just sum them up in one thing or put it in individual variables and show what they are or just print individual gets afterwards. They all work with the same way. So you simply get every single element of the vector and because every single element is the future the get will return the integer value async returned uh, are we okay with this async and vectors so now uh, let's take a look at different things that we can actually run to do the same thing okay so um, here is the example of finding the sum of series of numbers as I've done in the other one one by one I'm, I'm adding the uh, adding them one one by one and uh, I'll find the sum it's a single thread and I run it and the single th thread runs and the execution goes like seriously how many processes are working holy schmoly okay let's wait do you think it's hung It's probably hung. I think so. No, it didn't. Okay, there you go. So it took, uh, but the reason that you see it says two seconds, it's because so many things were happening. My action was happening that much, but I have so many windows and stuff open that it went like that. So uh, it is this much time for this. So, um, <laughs> so it is not hung. Okay, so that's that one. So it's single thread. This one is saying IJ. This is single thread. I'm going somewhere with this. You've all seen this. Now I'm doing the exact same thing with a multi-thread. So this is the multi-thread version of it, which I essentially go through it, and I'm going to see how many CPUs I have, and I'm going to cr create a, 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 a thread, um, and I'm going to... Uh, divide the number of things that I'm going to do uh, by the uh, start at the end. So the number of threads that I have, I'm just going to divide the size by that. Yes, we'll see. Um, okay, so you know on line 13, right? Mm -hmm. It says like vector in data, then afterwards like one like 10, okay. 100 million, and then yes, afterwards yeah, one. It's, it's 100 million. Um, Yes. Yeah. So um, it means 100 million integers and set each one of them to one. Oh, wait, you can do that with vectors? Yeah. That's how the vectors work. Okay, give me a So you can, you can write the number of elements and each, each one is set to what? And so the first argument is how many? Yeah, and it's very possible the time that it takes, some of the time that it takes is actually the vector being set to one. <laughs> that's why it's okay. you know what I mean 
So hardware concurrency tells me how many processors I have that can that can run threads. So that's the number of processors. Then I'm going to have uh, uh, partial numbers in my threads, as you see, one by one, and they're all zero. So that's if I have five, I create a vector of five partial, and I put zeros in each of them. Then I'll I'll start my clock and I'll get the chunk size one by one. I start from the beginning of the chunk and I go to the end of the chunk and I keep adding to it. So each each time uh, I'm I'm testing, I'm adding the next portion of it, and I give them to separate threads one by one. Then I'm going to join the threads, and after that I'm going to find out what was the the outcome of the whole thing. So if I run this, it's probably going to be a little faster because it runs on multiple CPUs on my machine and therefore it's going to go like that. Okay? I can do the exact same thing again. So uh, multi thread sum. The third one, I'm going to do it with async. And sometimes when you write the single thread, when the process is not something genuine and doing things like this, you will see single thread actually runs faster than multi-thread. Don't be discouraged with that because the uh, weight of creating threads and things like that may actually uh, play a factor, but just be a... Uh, 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 be advised. <laughs> okay, so this is the exact same thing that I'm doing, but I'm doing it with uh, async, and I'm putting futures in a vector, and I'm doing the exact same thing over here, but instead of having join coming out and join them back, all the good stuff that I have, I push the asyncs one by one into the future. The difference is that this partial sum of mine actually returns the sum. So running this, that's going to be the difference. There we go. So this is actually running faster. Okay, so that's that one. That's with async. So K I J K L async sum. Now the next one is an interesting thing that I want to show you. Okay, so for the next one, I want you to uh, uh, um, mm, let me see what should I use for this. So we have a function. We have an alg. Remember, that I told you all the things that you are doing right now. You can actually give. Uh, uh, all uh, all the things that are doing right now, we have standard template libraries that we can say actually do such and such in in uh, uh, in parallel. Now I'm going to give you an example on that. So at C plus uh, plus cre seventeen, uh, created an algorithm called transform reduce. So transform reduce works like this. So uh, transform reduce the arguments that transform reduce receives is this so the very first thing that transform reduce receives is how to do it so um, it is a, let's transform reduce arcs so the very first thing that it receives is the execution policy. Now the execu execution policy, the execution policy could be uh, uh, sequence. So when I say sequence, I essentially mean uh, STD execution sequence. Okay, something like that. So it means it's sequential. No multi, no no parallel processing. The other one 
parallel, so it's got to be STD execution parallel, or parallel and sequential, which is, uh, which means uh, it is vectorized, uh, uh, vectorized. Pa it's parallel and it's vectorized. So the quickest one is parallel. Okay, let's put it that way. So that's the execution part. So you can tell to as a first argument to transform, transform, reduce, you can say this. What transform, reduce mean? It means give me a range of things and I will transform it using a function to you want and reduce it to one thing. So essentially, this is a beautiful thing to find the sum of things. So uh, it is this C++17 C++ uh, uh, algorithm uh, combines the transform and the reduce algorithms of C++ 14 and 11 and so on and so forth. So what it does, the second argument that you are giving is an iterator for the beginning and then you have another iterator for the end. So where does it begin? Where does it end? And then in here, you are giving what is the initial value of the result that it's going to be reduced into. Then you give to it one operation, binary operation, that is supposed to happen between the neighboring elements. Whatever series of operators, remember all the operators that we have, minus, plus, uh, multiply the uh, operation templates that we had. So, so the operation, binary operation, operation uh, between elements, and the last one is the function that is supposed to transform each element. So each element of this range of information each element of this iteration will be passed to a function and the return value of those will be will participate in that binary operation so this is the function to apply to each element so I'm gonna use this to do the exact same thing that I have done before, which means uh, in here I have ice stream, I have vector, I do not need future, uh, I need execution, I need execution, uh, chrono I need, and uh, numeric, yeah. So th this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to write So in here, I'm going to write a vector as I did before. So uh, std vector, uh, uh, vector of integers, and it's going to be data. And how many things did we have? Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight zeros. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and each one of them will be one. So that's my vector. Um, then I'm going to say uh, auto start uh, for the for the chrono thingy. Auto start will be equal to std chrono uh, high resolution high resolution clock that is set to now. So that's the start. Now see what I'm going to do in here. I'm going to say long long that's total will be equal to std transform reduce okay now for first argument I'm gonna say std execution parallel okay so that's the first thing that I'm gonna give it to it the second thing I'm going to give it is the beginning of the data. So I'm going to say data the beginning 
and the other one is going to be data dot end so data beginning data end now what do I want the initial value of the result to be uh, zero long long okay so that's that one I want what do I want to do uh, between the elements I want to add them up so I'm gonna say over here I want STD plus that's the operator that I want to send it to and what transformation I want to happen to every and each element no transformation I just want to get the value out what do I do easiest thing is to write a lambda so I'm gonna write lambda int value and in here I'm just gonna say return the value that's all do nothing just return the value and at the end I'm gonna say auto uh, I'm gonna do the exact same thing over here and is equal to the exact same thing and now I'm gonna uh, say STD uh, chrono uh, duration um, of uh, double diff will be set to end minus start okay that's the difference between the clocks now I'm gonna say see out uh, um, stdc out uh, I'm gonna say sum is total and go to no line uh, uh, and L and um, time taken C out I should have included STD up there C out uh, so time will be uh, diff dot count seconds now all that process that I that it taken me over there to do all those stuff just got changed to one simple function call and if I run the program if I don't have any errors hopefully there we go done in 0 0.28 seconds the sum was found as you see that ginormous thing that I have written over here is just changed to one uh, algorithm invocation learn your algorithms there is no way that for, for me to go through every single one of them the list of uh, all of them are on the thing on the what shall we call it uh, on the uh, uh, um, the page for the algorithms take a look at the algorithms that we have and you can just uh, do most of the things that you want to do with simply using the SDL. Wilson, go ahead. Um, so the so for um on the right hand side, line fifteen, right? Um, hardware concurrency, like it counts how many threads transform there are, right? Does um, the best and transform does finds the best optimization automatically. You don't need to worry about that. No, so I meant like um. Okay, uh, not how many, cores trying you to, have. How, how many, pardon? Cores, CPUs. Four? How many Wait. C so, just write this how statement in your main and run it. Yeah. A number, an integer okay. number is returned. That integer number says how many cores, CPU cores, core, C O R E. Oh. Your computer has. Okay, so it doesn't act. Does it what? So it's not to count like how many um it does, it's not to count how many threads there are, right? No, no, no. It counts how many threads okay. your computer can execute efficiently at the same time. Oh, okay, 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 okay. This is I the capability wondering. of your machine. Well, you don't need to worry about okay. that with the SDL. See, we need okay. to understand how Palaret programming works. I when I used to teach int422 and C sharp and all the good stuff, I would say, learn how the code works, use the libraries and hack them instead. It takes lots of time. It uh, uh, saves lots of time. 
understand how it works, then use what the system gives you. Okay? Any questions? Yes, go ahead. So for the last function that you said, function to apply to each element, does it change the actual value of the vector? This one you're like talking you, about? Yeah. No, this is because it's transformed, right? Yeah. Like, for example, you want to multiply every element by 0 0.3. You can do that. Or you want but to return will... twice the time. So you can say value multiplied by 2. So but it won't change the actual value of the oh, no, data. No, 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 no. It transforms no. that. That's why they call it transform reduce. Transform by itself gives you the exact same size vector with the information that you have that transforms one by one. Reduce algorithm reduces everything into one. It means you want to find the average, you want to do something to everything and reduce it by one. So if we have the code right now, like if you return the value multiplied by two, it will give you the Twice sum it. multiplied by two, right? Yes. Okay, okay, thank you. All right. So this, this apl is applied, is uh, applied to applied to each element. Yes, Omar. I just wanted to say, so when it's applying this function, because I'm looking at the plus as well, so does it first apply what you say inside your function first, and then afterwards yes, it's, yes, it's up all the values? Transforms, then applies. Okay, that's why I want to make sure. So then, for instance, if you wanted to do uh, a, like you want to combine them by, for instance, multiplication, you would just do some random stuff to it. And then it would multiply all of them together, exactly. whatever operation. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's all. I want to make sure. Thank you. All right. Okay. So that's using the STL. LM using the STL. All right. Okay. So I have finished all the uh, uh, all the quiz transforma transformations. So now I have all the quizzes available. I'm going to post it and give you four days to go through them. One by one, you're going to know exactly what it is. Uh, or even maybe more, I'll give you a week. So go through it. Next week when you're coming in, uh, we're just going to have a quiz on this topic, which means uh, the quiz that you're going to have next week will be on... This one only, multi-threading and thread classes. Okay, that's going to be your quiz. Six and seven, you're going to have a week to do it for algorithms and raw pointers and smart pointers. Well, for six and seven, I'll give you a week to do it on your own time. Quiz eight is going to be in class on, uh, on Friday. If I am healthy and I can walk. If I cannot walk, then it's this one is going to go on light. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, this time I'm going to post this right now. And please check, make sure it is actually there for some unknown reason. Last time I pushed and only the main was there. Let me just commit one more time. And I'm going to say multi thread. Continued, commit, and push, and OK. Please drop me a, a message immediately if, again, it's not there. Uh, that's it. Uh, I have a meeting in five minutes, so I have to run. Have yourself a beautiful day, everyone, and I will see you soon. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks for the buy. It's actually nice to hear somebody answering to you. <laughs>